uh, L.C. Department of um, Theater and Dance. She's also an associate um, chair of that department. Um, she's um, the funding director of the uh, Performance Exchange, which is one of the department's community engagement programs. Uh, she is a Northern California um, uh, native. She's, um, she got her BA degree from, in history from the University of California in Davis. And then, um, she went to the University of California at Sacramento to do an MA in uh, Arts. And then she um, went back to the University of uh, California, Davis to do the MFA in Dramatic Arts. And she remained there and got her PhD in uh, performance studies from that university. Um, she is extremely well published. Uh, her research in creative activities um, engage questions about the human relationship to place. And that is reflected in her, uh, the title of her talk today, which is Place, Displaced, and Replace. Um, her essay is about performance training, site specific performance. Uh, her, her essays have appeared in many journals, including about performance, um, the Australasia Drama Studies, Body, Space, and Technology, Royal Guard, an Australian journal about dance, Canadian Journal of Practice Based Research in Theater. Journal of Dance Education, Research in Drama Education, and Theater, Dance, and Performance Training. Uh, essays about performance and community have been included in the edited volumes, uh, African Theater, uh, Diasporas, which is edited by James Curry, and the Embedded Consciousness Performance Technologies, published by uh, Padre uh, Macmillan. Co-authored work with Dutch Reisner, which is one of the colleagues here, have appeared in Art Education Policy Review, International Journal of Education, and um, Arts and Teaching uh, Artist <coughs> Journal. She's the author of several books, including Meeting Places, Locating Dessert um, Consciousness in Performance, which was published in 2014. With Dogna Reimer, she has Hybrid Lives of Teaching Artists in Dance and Theater with Karina, published also in 2014. Um, with uh, Oprah Feeling, she has a piece entitled Technologies of Reception in the Commercial Flash Mob which appeared in an uh, edited um, anthology entitled Embodying Consciousness in Configuring Performance Technologies. It was published in 2013 by Padre Macmillan. Um, with um, With another colleague of hers, she has a piece entitled Stretching Time, Writing Grungus Forms of Women, uh, published in the Canadian Journal of Practice-Based Research in, in Theatre. Um, I would be very remiss if I did not mention that Mary has been a very, very firm friend of the Humanities Centre as indicated by her involvement in her programs. This, in fact, is going to be her sixth ground back talk. She started giving talks uh, way back in 2012, and has given talks uh, uh, every other year uh, since then. She was a recipient of one of our faculty fellowships in 2015-2016, she was a resident scholar 
in 2011, 2012. And I do remember very vividly her service as a resident scholar. She uh, was a very active member of that group. Um, she um, attended every one of our Brumbach uh, uh, or Scholars Round Tables and made very important contributions to the conversations. And she even wanted to help us to get together and uh, publish and edited um, anthology uh, together as, as, um, as resident scholars. And she has participated in working groups. I'm sort of uh, talking slowly. I'm wondering if we're good. She's, uh, we're finally, yeah, we'll just let it go. She's, she's going to have to go. We're moving on. Yeah. All right, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you for giving me that. Yes, with our, so her title today is Place, Displace, Replace. And um, so without further ado, I ask you to welcome to the podium. Uh, Professor Mary Anderson. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. Um, this is certainly the, the largest attendance I've ever had for um, for a brown bag talk, and so I'm, I'm just honored that you've um, come and given me your time. And um, I want to um, suggest, really, at the outset, I've taken a longer, like a much longer paper I've written and I'm going to read just a portion of it. And in the process of making selections about what I'm going to focus on, I decided to focus my attention for today on, um, well, primarily the narrative of making this piece. So that's sort of the, the meat and potatoes of it. But then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, processes of reflection, the value of praxis, particularly with regard to um, what I perceive as a, a failed experiment because um, I have an ongoing interest in failure in different ways, particularly my own failure. <laughs> I'm fascinated with that. So um, I, I must apologize in advance because I, um, maybe a month or so ago, when the publicity was created for this, I thought maybe I would frame it more in terms of um, how fosters information about, um, about anthropo a, the uh, artist's ethnographer. And so if you came here, <laughs> because you were mostly interested in me talking about the relationship between Hal Foster's artist as ethnographer and my own work. Um, I apologize and I'd be happy to send you my full paper if you'd like to look at that. Um, uh, but for today, I think the strongest portion is more about this idea of service learning project. Um, so I'm just going to read, um, my little video is um, it's not working, but I, I must confess that I felt a little bit uncomfortable with it, and I wasn't quite sure if it was what I wanted anyway, um, but I like the idea of it. So um, you're just going to have me reading to you, and um, if you want to, you can imagine that there once was a possibility of watching students improvising while I was talking, um, which probably would have been interesting or maybe frustrating, who knows. So, um, so here I go. The following pages explore how a particular service learning performance came into being and how, in my estimation, it failed in a useful way. When I write that it failed in a useful way, I mean that it inadvertently invoked a poetics of failure, producing a state of psychic and existential uncertainty made manifest through the exposure of a particular structural vulnerability at work in the performance making process. To this end, with regard to such performances that take the chance of getting things terribly wrong, I invoke Della Pollock, who explains that where there is error, there is possibility. Pollock suggests that in instances such as these, we might elect to substitute consideration of the pleasures and power of improvisational error for anything like failure to do things right. This corresponds well with the thinking of John Baldacchino, who recommends that we embrace art's groundless forms of meaning, which are beyond product and process. Cumulatively, then, I am remembering backwards into an abyss of the recent past that sits very presently in my body, but which, let's face it, is out of my reach. 
I reach back in this way, taking encouragement from Sally Mackey, whose retrospective analysis of a performance event from her distant past prompted her to revisit the way in which she and her students archived the event, creating a series of sites of memory through objects and artifacts. And I reach back in this way, taking guidance from Ann Brewster, who advocates for a kind of reflective narration that literalizes a post-retrieval idea of memory, in which writing is not an instrument of the retrieval of stored information, but instead is characterized as a technology of memory, writing as a technology of memory, and memory as techne. Inspired to uncover the paradoxical and aporetic aspects of this event from my past, how it has contributed to my becoming, I will draw on fragments of reflective writing. This will be a performative, reflective, polyvocal story. So here's the story. It started with nature, a perhaps entirely uncritical need to touch limbs, feel grass rustle beneath our feet, smell the sweetness of a flower and bloom, and to do all of this in January in Michigan. We were tasked with creating a performance for a class of fourth graders that would enrich their knowledge of local geography, history, and ecology. Wide open space in that task. Their teacher loves Belle Isle, a city park that due to insufficient city finances had recently become a state park in a controversial battle over autonomy and implicit and explicit feelings about the inherent exclusivity that might come with the transition. Since we assume bringing the children to Belle Isle in midwinter is an impossibility, we begin to conceive of how we might bring Belle Isle to their school. Might we become trees, swans, fairies, clouds, and river water? What or who might speak in this interactive drama? Importantly, what is it that performance can do to serve learning? From the outset, it seemed essential that we use improvisational experiments to discover what we did not know about the island park. In other words, rather than understanding performance exclusively as an illustrative tool that would simply illuminate or inspire learning outcomes matched to fourth grade curriculum in geography, history, and ecology, we instead hoped that studies in physical and vocal improvisation would invite us to consider not only the literal, but also the figurative, the metaphorical dimensions of what we saw and experienced of the nature of Belle Isle. Preparing for our first rehearsal, I chart a course for a winter hike for us on the easternmost tip of the island, the William Livingstone Lighthouse Trail. Although it is January, it has been a mild winter thus far. With adequate clothing, we will all have our first encounter with the flora and fauna in its dormant state. Not unlike ethnographers, we will each have our own little blank page book where we will collect field notes, observations about the environment, maybe even preliminary interpretations about the cultural forces that have shaped the environment. I will be a bit of a tour guide, sharing information about the formation of this part of the island, important events over the last few hundred years, who and what inhabits this space now. This is the plan, but on that first rehearsal, Bonnie arrives in a cast, a broken leg while auditioning for the department's spring musical, Oklahoma. Yes, that exclamation is built into the title. So we will not be walking the mile loop on the Livingstone Trail as planned, but I am not ready to abandon our field trip. As luck would have it, the Belle Isle Conservatory is quite open, offering us a comparatively warm, wait, Belle Isle Conservatory, did I say that? Okay, I said it again. The Belle Isle Conservatory is quite open, offering us a comparatively warm, small space in which, it, um, in which to experience a collection of plants that represent quite a vast ecological spectrum. After a brief orientation to the history of the conservatory, I send in each of my students with a post-it note, set of instructions to guide their exploration. Each of them is to find an affinity area, some micro-location within the conservatory to which they feel called. This is a typical introductory improvisational exercise when working with an ensemble in the studio or in any space. Find a place where the light, the feel, the energy, anything speaks to you, invites you in, calls you to spend time, become absorbed into the space, place yourself within the space, be mindful of your body, your breath, your weight, and how it interacts with the atmosphere of your affinity space. Let your chosen space fix your attention, draw your imagination into the tiny particularities of how earth meets sky in this glass house, how the warmth of the soil fills your nostril and 
fills your nostrils and caresses your cheeks. Find the story that needs to be told in this little world. The performers are collector interpreters in this scenario. The conservatory is a generative environment that is reflective of a series of historical and cultural moments. We are present tense bodies traversing through the present tense and simultaneously a series of past tenses while attempting to render some future tense experience tailored for nine and 10 year old children as of yet to be determined. But after several weeks of oscillating between the rehearsal studio and the conservatory, building a set of intertwined stories about plants and the people who love them, the people who need them, collect them, the conservatory has offered us so much and we've spent so much time developing characters and relationships and scenarios, we figure we must ultimately perform there too. An easy transposition of our original intent. We will bring the children to the conservatory. As we make plans to bust the fourth graders to the conservatory and we seek permission to perform in the space from the stewards of the island, a kind of double-layered double meta-critique develops. On the one hand, my students become increasingly curious about the conservatory as an environment, an environment that they love, but which represents a set of ideas that they don't entirely understand. Why did Anna Scripps Whitcomb, whose name is given to the conservatory, collect so many orchids? For this particular lover, lover of flowers, this particular lover of the conservatory, who is historicized as having saved the formerly dilapidated structure, why was abundance such an important part of collecting? Hundreds of orchids donated by Scripps Whitcomb to the conservatory are notable because of their quantity, vast depths of orchids, juxtaposed against the vast breadth of the other species and ecosystems represented throughout the space. Carefully categorized with placards that share the official name, the layman's name, and the country or region of origin, the placards, of course, are utterly modest, almost completely overlooked by the spectacular nature of the living, breathing plants about whom they comment. But my students become curiouser and curiouser about these organizing impulses that structure the setting. Alongside this growing interest in the cultural influences at play in the conservatory, we become increasingly sensitized to the way that educational experiences transpire between a team of volunteers and visiting classes of third graders who are taken on a tour of the space through a series of questions and answers about what they see. This plant is called this. Why do you think this plant is called this? No, that's not it. No, that's not it either. Here's why. Just as our script is finalized and we have nearly set a date for the performance, our partner school realizes that the field trip can only take place on a Tuesday, a day when the conservatory is closed. That's not the end of the world, we think. We'll just reset the piece back on the Livingstone Trail. That's open on Tuesday, and now that we are looking at performance dates in May, we actually get to return to the original idea of bringing the children out into nature. We revise the script. The characters that populate our drama, among them the orchids, the squirrels, the architect Albert Kahn, and Scripps Whitcomb herself, they will just have a new reason to be out on the trail instead of inside the conservatory. The fourth grade class teacher begins to prepare her students for the experience by introducing key aspects of the geography, the history, the ecology of the island, all of which they will encounter and study within the context of the performance itself. Our piece is rehearsed over several weeks across the mile-long stretch of the Livingstone Trail. With each rehearsal, we add new dimensions to the script, new songs and dances, create new questions designed to invite our young audience to express how the environment makes them feel, educate us about what they know, question the many dimensions of the narratives of place that inform this park. We are prepared, we think, to be with them in the space. The Sunday night before the performance, the teacher texts me to let me know that Detroit Public School teachers will be on a sick out the next day. Over the weekend, it has been announced that the Strap District does not have enough funds to pay employees past June. For the two-thirds of teachers who have elected to spread out their pay across the summer, that means that if uh, they go to work the following day, they will be essentially working for free. Not to worry, though, this will likely be a one-day thing. Representatives will be negotiating with legislators all day for an emergency aid package. Everyone will be back to school by Tuesday and the field trip will proceed. On Monday, we call and text back and forth all day as news unfolds. By the end of the day, we are reassured that all schools will be open on Tuesday, but early on Tuesday morning, the news is different. This will be the second day of sick outs. The fourth graders will not be coming to see the performance. And because of the elaborate permissions and planning entailed in the endeavor, we know that they will not see this particular performance at all this year.
On that Tuesday, instead, we perform for the 20-something crowd that turns out to support their university student colleagues. Surely this is a capstone to the whole experience, and yet, missing the very people for whom the work was made, we end the afternoon feeling a bit empty and ridiculous in some way. To whom or for whom was this done? Our experience creating the performances on Belle Isle is an example of what Peter Woods refers to as critical educational events in teaching and learning. Woods explains that such experiences have the potential to exert a transformative impact on the work of the teaching artist in the long run. Critical educational events are instrumental in helping learners become person, and by learners I don't just mean my students, I mean me, like all of us as learners. In the discussion that follows, I'm interested in illuminating a few of the ways in which community performance practices, such as the one I've just described, construct relationships across professional contexts with varying policy, value, and practice imperatives. And so the methods of research and practice itself are also subject to multiple pressures. As James Thompson explains, teaching artists are almost always guests in the communities in which they work. Their work is often temporary, and furthermore, their guesthood is carefully negotiated is a carefully negotiated position that is acutely sensitive in relation to the histories of colonialism and exploitation. This position can make critique particularly difficult, both during and after a project, given that the teaching artist does not share a common home and often does not share a common context with participants. All of these factors are constructed in conversation with the constitution of community, as Miranda Joseph explains, sites of values, of fetishized identities, of culture, which are mythologized and romanticized as being autonomous from capital. Peter Woods explains that critical events in teaching and learning have four significant functions and that they promote education, can be critical for teacher change, have an important preservation and confirmatory function for teacher, teachers, <clears throat> and can be critical for the profession as a whole. Significantly, Woods notes that we cannot know that any particular educational experience has been critical until it has ended and we reflect on the event. To that extent, it's only through reflection or a retrospective analysis of our work and its impact that we come to appreciate the value of any particular experience personally and professionally. Paulo Freire writes that reflection, true reflection, leads to action. Philip Taylor expands upon this perspective, explaining that Freire developed the word praxis in order to, de to demonstrate the way that action and reflection are interdependent in educational processes. My particular process of reflection in this essay is, is about challenging myself to reconsider what it is I expect or want from an art-based activity. Further, the reflective practices of community-based teaching artists raise questions not only about our expectations regarding the arts, but also what it is we want from communities. Placing Wood's ideas regarding the function of critical events in teaching and learning into conversation with these ideas of practice, praxis, I'd like to suggest that teaching artists involved in service learning are frequently operating in a kind of future perfect tense, characterized by a phrase something like, I will have done this work differently next time. Trapped within the confines of organizational expectations and a lack of practice in communicating one's own expectations, the teaching artist often experiences an absence of voice or strategic power. The potentiality is there for both expression and intervention, but because there is perhaps no training program that can adequately prepare a teaching artist, which is further complicated by the guest status of most all teaching artists, particularly in site-based or place-based work, a facilitator is often caught in the liminal space between student and teacher. This future perfect stance is also implicitly encouraged by the ways in which ideas of reflection and praxis have become embedded into much of the work of community-based practitioners. The very notion of praxis itself is predicated on the assumption that one will reflect afterwards about one's actions in the present in order to enact a different outcome in the future. As Dorothy Heathcote explains, a common root all teachers have to grow is reflective power not only within themselves, but within their students as well. In other words, the future perfect stance is encouraged not only for practitioners, but for participants. As pointed out by Schoen and Moon and others, cultivating a sense of reflection in action can promote a sense of the ongoingness of practi practice and the interrelationship between various projects. In fact, participants have reported feeling that reflective, pre reflective time following a project is just as important as being part of the actual project itself to the extent that they are able to make connections to their own lives and gain a deeper understanding and awareness of the process that they have been a part of. I would like 
therefore to suggest that although I feel there maybe there was little I was capable of doing to change the particular outcomes involved in the sharing of this project, a single thing I feel I could have done but did not do was to organize more formally a process of reflection for all groups of participants. Eliciting reflection among participants can nonetheless represent challenges. As Penny Bundy explains, in some cases, reflection requires a necessary distance achieved through the passage of time or through dramatic representation in order to open the way for reflection that might not otherwise be available. Tourette advocates for the integration of reflective processes throughout an arts activity, ensuring that her own role as facilitator is shared and negotiated through the group. That said, the sharing and negotiating, negotiating of leadership within the group presents its own challenges. The reflective teaching artist is continually challenged to reflect on processes of reflection, exploring alternative modalities of assessment, looking for growth and development amongst participants, even while remaining cautious to avoid evangel quote unquote evangelized reports of personal victories and making miracles happen against all odds. Clearly I made no miracles happen. But mm -hmm. It would seem that the art of the teaching artist includes virtually continuous reflective time um, as described by Pamela Bernard, in which the teaching artist places reflection at the heart of the creative process. So if this essay essentially constitutes a note to self, which by extension is a note to any past or future teaching artist embarking on a new project, I suggest that embracing <coughs> Bernard's idea of placing reflection at the heart of the creative process might not only enhance the experience and perhaps even the quality of the outcomes for teaching artists and participants, but might also slow down what can uh, sometimes be a rather frantic process of assemblage, stretching out time by taking time to reflect in between sessions and in between projects is not only good practice, but good praxis, um, but also perhaps a strategy to bridge the gap between the present and the always already in place future perfect in which the mistakes of today will be corrected tomorrow. Thank you. I'm Ben Berkeley from the History Department. Hello. I'm really glad to meet you. Um, a lot of my thinking lately has had to do with naming. Mm. And I mean, I, I want to take you back to the first part of your mm. talk, which really interested me. But the, the whole business about kind of finding names, mm. and which, which happens in what we call the past. Right? Mm. We, we always have it in the past because what we name, what we have, what we've named it now, isn't what it's always been named. Mm. Um, and so I w I'd like you to maybe say some more things about why you think that that people feel compelled to find a name, as with the little tags on the plants. Mm. I mean, is it to prevent sort of fields of yeah. impossible number, do you think, or mm. or what? So so talk to me about naming, because it was important <laughs> to your students. It um, was. And, and obviously important to you. And so it, it's mm. a question, really, of what the name comes to mean. As when mm. a field of chaos comes to be called the Age of Jackson. Yeah, You know, right. we sort of name it something and we're comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is um, that, um, the, the past is really functioning in some really interesting ways in your work, isn't mm. it? Because you seem to be situating um, present and future mm -hmm. perfect in some kind of past. Mm -hmm. And so, which may be related to the business about naming, but not quite. I mean, what, mm. what role do you think that need to sort of situate and make a pastness mm. for the present is playing in all of this? Can you talk to that? Yeah. I'd be delighted. I mean, it's such a lovely, um, you know, lovely opportunity. Um, I'll start by saying I'm sure there's many people that can say things much more articulately no, than no, I can about these topics. I mean, it's really interesting. But I'll certainly, so, I'll, I'll say yeah. from, so I've, always, I've been interested in ordering impulses, I think from, uh, just from a, like a layman's perspective. Um, and it started when I, um, I'm from California, and when I was living in California, for a long time I lived in the Sacramento Valley, um, and they have this plain area where, um, is it, I think it's an alluvial plain, and uh, this is part of the reason why the Sacramento Valley is so fertile, you know, the water comes down, and for long periods of time, naturally, the water sits on top of the ground, so you really can't build a house there. But when people decided they wanted to build houses there, they had to push all the water away and create all of this elaborate le levee system. So I was sort of interested in that, and then I went on and did some work in Australia with a performance group that traveled from Sydney to the Central Desert 
and they were also, they also became fascinated in a sort of organic way, I guess. I mean, when I say organic, I just mean they were fascinated with these processes of naming, yeah, naming becoming, of the content. And, and becoming one set of meanings as against another. Yes, exactly. Right. And the, like sort of the politicized nature of that yeah. and the sort of, a, a particularly in the Australian context, the association with colonialism. Um, and imperialism. So the, the, the systems, you know, the, the very systems by which people arrived at, um, at, and in Australia and created taxonomies of all the things that they saw in pictures. So this was a fascination of the performance group and then this has sort of had an abiding. So I don't know that you can go into, to me, I don't know how to go inside the uh, conservatory and not be struck I mean, first you're struck by that sensational, and it's a very visceral experience. Is there anyone that hasn't been inside the conservatory on Belle Isle? Okay, I mean, it's a big glass house, right? A big, warm glass house, and so there's this amazing physical experience that you have. But then if you're there for any length of time, you do start noticing these placards and this idea of place, right, where everything is from. It's a big greenhouse. It's a big yeah. greenhouse, that's right. But it's a big greenhouse. But there's a then in time and place that yes. seems to be essential. Yes, and yeah. also, I, to, yes. To what? I mean, you <laughs> What is it? Yeah, where does yeah. all of that come from? Why? I mean, so I, there are so many different histories. There's so many different layers of history. Um, our American historian could certainly give us more information. But yes, I mean, and, and the place, exactly, the place itself, I mean, this place itself, particularly whenever you go into a structure that has stood and endured through time, you're already always aware of how much it's alive versus other things that aren't. So Belle Isle itself, you have certain structures that have been decimated over time. And the, and the Belle Isle Conservatory remains. So whenever something, one thing remains and another thing doesn't, you become more acutely aware of its pastness, I think, or I mean, that's how it feels. I become aware of its pastness. Okay, we'll let other people talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Holly. If the students have an opportunity to um, reflect on experience at the end of the semester? Oh yes, oh yes, so my students did. Um, the sad thing was so we did the, the final performance was it's so at the very last day we could possibly do it, was the very last day of finals. And then it, that was exactly when the, um, the, uh, the sick outs were taking place. So there was no opportunity for my students to reconnect with the fourth graders, which I think was unfortunate. And so I alone was the one that coordinated reflective processes with my students and then with the fourth graders as like a separate, a separate entity. Yeah. I was thinking one thing they might have learned was how they coped with disappointment or plans that changed. Or yeah. Even yeah. You said it was a failure. I imagine mm. that there were many um, things that they learned. Yeah. I mean, um, meaning the, oh, that the fourth graders learned. Your students. Oh, my students. Yeah. I think. I think they were aware of you know how how disappointing it was to not be able to have the students as audience members. I mean, you you work. They worked an entire year <laughs> to make this show. But yeah, to have like more of a human connection. I think I think even if we had just done the performance for them at their school, yeah. that alone would have been fantastic, and then had you know some ability to have an exchange afterwards. But yeah. the thing that's so wonderful is that each time there was a discontinuity, mm. every time there was a paradigmatic shift, <laughs> there was new meaning found. Yeah. yeah. And that's what's interesting and not a failure. Sure. I mean, in right. certainly at least at least academically. Well. Yeah. You said you could make this available, like this sure. essay available? Sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, great. And, um, sorry, I forgot my second question. That's okay. Yeah, I'll come back. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Kate, um, so you talked about the feeling of, um, who was the performance for? Mm -hmm. um, so I know we've talked about this a little mm -hmm. bit, but how do, how do you feel about um, performance for performance sake, for the oh, sake yeah. of, of sharing? It is all of those things. It is all of those things. Um, so it was, it certainly was just that, and it was, 
this is a thing that's sort of tricky about service learning also. I, you, there are many different ways to perceive the value of it. Um, one of it is just as a training experience. So Wayne State students that do this get a certain kind of training. Um, so even just sort of running around in the fields every week, as opposed to running around in the rehearsal room exclusively, that alone is valuable. Um, but then what happens when you create this artifact that only a few people see, or what if you make a performance that's really just for you? <laughs> um, I mean, people came, people came, uh, mostly people that knew people in the show. Um, but yeah, when you train students in a dial like in a way to create a performance that has like a dialogue, it was the whole idea was to have a dialogue that the performance was about taking the students on this one mile loop so that they could then experience all the things they had been learning about. And then there's just sort of almost incidental that my students were performing as these various characters that they were meeting as the illustration, but the idea was that the performance was to draw out what the students knew. Because at the end of the day, the fourth graders knew more than we did, even about everything, because they had learned in this very sequential way. So that's what. The, so when you take that piece away, now it's just a sort of a hollow vessel, but it's still entertaining and adorable and funny. I mean, we had like Albert Kahn doing this Beyonce rap, <laughs> which was kind of awesome. But you know, but it's it's gratuitous and silly in some ways, which performance are, always feels <coughs> like it is always on the edge of being gratuitous and silly. Was what was missing chronology? Oh, you mean what was missing with by yeah, not having yeah, the students? Oh, I mean that the performance just ran the way it but, does. It's just. But that when it becomes mere, whatever you just said, it was it what was chronology? What was missing? What, as they walk around the island, and oh. then suddenly don't. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, the chronology was still there. I mean, all aspects, it's just that instead of it being that the characters were, the characters had a narrative that they were sharing, then, then they, would, they were designed to ask questions right. of the kids so that the kids are then telling us what they're feeling, what they're thinking, where this, you know, um, identifying plants, talking about history, so that okay, when our calm comes down, they knew who that about, is. Talking about history, and so if the history is gone, yeah. The context then it, then it becomes the hip hop rap thing. Right? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. So, so what's missing is what the past or chronology or what when the dialogue is yeah, missing. Yeah, which is situated too. Yes, that's right. And I'm thinking about another level, kind of related to that, where the Wayne State students had something to say, something to share. Yes. And how frustrating that there was no one with whom to share it, and then the students, the elementary students, are. Are, what are they doing? They're just at home because their teachers are on a sick out. So there are talented people with something to offer, and the kids are the ones that are losing out in this unfortunate you know, reality that we have. Mm -hmm. That's like a whole other level, but maybe um, is there that you didn't have a chance to. Uh, it's talk a certain about. kind of gridlock, which I yeah. think is really interesting. To me, again, going back sort of like in a more intellectually this is the intellectual piece of it is it's that to me this whole scenario is emblematic of a certain gridlock that I've experienced any number of times but this is an amplification of that gridlock the all of the different political dimensions right the, the teacher sick out which I totally understood and totally support was nonetheless sort of the single hugest downfall the fact that like I you know I personally paid for the bus <laughs> like and we don't get that money back like then that's okay. That's okay. It's just that it's so typical of just how how certain things work. So how to find ways to talk about it? I mean, reflective praxis is one way. That's one way to talk about it. But there's a lot of different ways that one could talk about what this is. Um, and the beautiful way you've shared your paper. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. Um, Mary and Holly, I wonder if, uh, if you could, or of course, Holly. Mm -hmm. Talk spoke about had your service learning experience mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, and I, I wonder if you could talk in a, a general way about how uh, the this kind of experiential learning uh, advances uh, your teaching, mm -hmm. advances uh, sure. students in fulfilling learning outcomes and. What it adds that from in a dimension that goes beyond uh, teaching it in the 
in the classroom. Mm. <laughs> I love the way you started out saying mm. you were including yourself as a learner, mm. and I think that's that's one way. You know, like we're all in it together in, your, in this process of discovering. I think that was clear with the way you explained your paper. Yeah, that's certainly the case. And then, like the students that I um, have, students that are working in the women's here on Valley Correctional Facility, and I'm their mentor for a service learning project. Um, and I mean, in that again, it's just it's sort of like a whole another level, a whole another transformative dimension of service learning that I haven't even fully wrapped my head around yet. Um, but getting the yeah, by, by removing us from our known context, a table like this, a room like this, me here, <laughs> like at the head of a table, like by taking myself out of that, it, it destabilizes me in a drastic and fabulous way. I mean, it, I mean it, it destabilizes my knowledge, it destabilizes my authority, it destabilizes, I, bec I become through necessity a facilitator of a series of experiences. And I am in the classroom as well. I'm, hopefully I'm always a facilitator of these sorts of experiences. But in the classroom, in my familiar territory, it's much easier to sort of trot through a sort of known exercises. And even though I'm adapting some of those same, I think, like I described one of the first exercises we did in the conservatory, it's similar to the kind of thing that we would do in the, uh, in the rehearsal room, but vastly different. Not only because it's a public space, and so asking students to, cr to like, create an affinity space with different parts of a public space and people are traveling through it, that alone is, is really different. Um, but yeah, I, and, and, to ha and to have a different audience for the, I mean, especially in theater, we make our work, generally speaking, for a sort of generic abstraction of an idea of an audience. We're about to put up Christmas Carol. It's not for one person. It's not for each individual. I mean, it's, it is for everybody at this table, but it's also for nobody at this table. It's just for the people on the other side of the proscenium art. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I don't mean that with any disrespect. I mean, it's it just sort of that's the consciousness <coughs> that drives theatrical production in a conventional way. And as soon as you move it and you, cre you try to create a, like a level of intimacy, which that's what I think, I mean, to an extent, that's what I think was part of the dialogue and the missing dialogue, the fourth graders never being there, because we created like a perception of who is going to be on the other end of the conversation. So it forces, I'm, I was thinking about both your presentations because they're, they're both in the arts and, and involve uh, ideas of creativity and teaching creativity. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's a special resonance for the students themselves in uh, in the way, in engaging uh, different kinds of publics, if you will. I think that's what I hear. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little bit nervous starting out, but by the end of the semester, it's almost unanimous that people have um, enjoyed the fact that they've been able to rise to the, ch to the challenge and done things that perhaps they didn't think they could do. Um, because there, there are many unknowns, I think, and um, so you are on this um, process of exploration. And I like how you learn um, about yourself personally, about your, um, just you know, personally, your, your potential, and uh, what's, what's maybe difficult, and um, just personal qualities that, that you can develop through um, being with other people in these situations. <coughs> And the proximity, I think, too. Like, I, we, I just came from, from, to here, I just came from um, my applied theater classes rotating through a K through 8 school. And they're taking three performances and rotating through each of the grades. So every week they go to a different um, classroom. And so they're learning massive amounts about what it is they've made because, not because, not only because they're sharing it, but because they're sharing it in a classroom you know, right close to the people that they've made it for, and they're learning something about themselves as performers, and the performances are genuinely changing as they go from, you know, through each class and each grade level. So I think that, like, porousness 
of once you get out of here and you start creating things for particular people and you're having more contact with people, then that is this enormous, enriching, like nourishing experience. Yeah. Uh, so you said that uh, there's like a piece in the dialogue that mm -hmm. was missing in, within your students, but not in the fourth grade students. Oh yeah, or, well I mean, yeah, the, they that we it was like we were traveling on you know is it, the analogy would be that like both of us you know both groups the fourth grade group and then my students were both traveling to meet each other on this path so that they could walk and talk together, and so there was a you know so that the, the the actual dialogue that was meant to happen on the path didn't happen, and then all these other things didn't happen because that was missing. So these guys still had their journey, which was sort of awesome and fabulous. And these guys still had their journey, which was awesome and fabulous. Um, and, and in some ways, the absence of the, making the final connection is sort of what would ordinarily happen. In ordinary universe, the, uh, you know, students in the fourth grade would have traveled through this curriculum and there wouldn't have been some field trip at the end or some performance outcome. And in ordinary circumstances, the Wayne State students would have made something, I mean, Kate, you guys make things in class all the time, and it lives and it dies in class. It doesn't go anywhere. So you see, I mean, that's that actually it's sort of just a repetition of what ordinarily happens all the time. Um, but take but the fact that we had had a different destination and that that didn't happen um, is what then is what yeah is making me think about it more. Um, 